listening to this is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning again, and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 439.1, <laughs> or 439 and a half of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yay! Today, recording day, is Friday, August 8th, 2024, and it is still uh, a scorcher of a day here at the Beaver Lodge, and uh, this is part two of the show, uh, because uh, if you had been watching part one, uh, we know that at uh, Mr. Uh, Grizzly's Den, uh, well, there is such thing as uh, some construction going on, and it was uh, making some additional noise, so... uh, We uh, decided to to, uh, end that episode a little earlier, Uh, but because the kits demanded that we uh, can continue a little longer, and uh, since I am the type of person that uh, does like to give the kits what they want, because, of course, your royale with cheese, Queen Beaver loves to serve, (laughs) I decided, heck, why not? It's not like I didn't have enough content. Let's just put it that way. All right. (laughs) Big thank you still goes to our podcast's founding sponsors, The Peppermaster, The Miss V Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Thank you so much for your support. We really, really, really appreciate it. All right. Um, Of course, don't have Mr. Beaver here, uh, Mr. Beaver, Mr. Grizzly, to introduce him, but... uh, you get just me today. <laughs> My mental health is doing well, uh, for those who are wondering. Uh, I am a little tired. For some reason, I'm still not able to sleep more than four hours in a row. I don't know if it's just the Olympics or stuff that have me too excited or whether or not something else is going on. Uh, but like, for the moment, I'm still feeling good. Uh, so I'm not tired. Uh, the 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 part of the day where I start hammering for, hammering nails with my forehead hasn't started yet. So I got plenty of energy and uh, let's see if we can continue a show for you kids and cubs. So I'm uh, so thankful to those of you who have decided to stay with us. Uh, Let's uh, do the magic mirror thing since we're here. So uh, good morning to you, Kit Elaine, who has uh, found a yummy recipe for flour-free spinach tortillas. Yum, yum, yum. (laughs) <laughs> Kit PNC Bio, Kit Linda M. Thank you, Kit Saucy. Thank you so very much. Uh, Kit Michael, glad to see you here as well. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Kit Cassie, hello, my dear. Uh, Miss, hello. Thank you for staying with us. We really, really appreciate it. Well, I do. I should, it's hard to not speak in we when I'm doing it uh, uh, solo. Hello, Kit Jen, my dear, my love, you beautiful, beautiful soul. Thank you so much for being here. Toronto Dan, my friend, way to go. I am so, so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. And your mom is delightful. 
saw in the video. She's just delightful. Please, uh, Patty, if you happen to be watching, hello. <laughs> and if she's not, please, Toronto Dan, please uh, give the message. Uh, hello, Kit Vim. Ah, so nice to see you. You always bring a smile to my face. Oh, we have uh, playing with 3D here. Um, I'm not sure I recognize the name. So uh, if you are new to the Beaver Lodge, welcome. And if it's just, uh, if you've been with us for a while and I just don't recognize the name, uh, I'm so sorry I hadn't noticed before, but uh, I am glad that you're here as well. We have Kit Tavi G with us. We have Kit James. Hey, my friend. Lovely to see you. Thank you so much. Oh, that's wonderful uh, that you're here. And I believe that that's everybody for the moment. Just scrolling, scroll. Oh, no, Kit Suzanne. Hello. Yes. Good morning, Bournemouth Beaver. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I think I've said hello to everyone. Okay. Um, and I did thank our founding sponsors. So I guess we can get started with the show. <laughs> oh, Mimi, Kit Tavi G. There you go. <laughs> Popping in at the last second. <laughs> Ah, the best damn fam in all of podcasting, and you've proven it by joining us for some extended beaver moments. All right, kits and cubs, uh, there is a little bit of extra news. You know what? Let's start with the fun stuff, because we did not have time to do it on the episode. But um, there is a bit of Olympics news, of course. Uh, we've had some uh, great performances by our Canadian athletes. Uh, I believe uh, as uh, we were leaving the previous show, I was scrolling through the comments so that I could catch up on what I was not able to read in the show. And uh, Kit Linda M. Uh, had informed us uh, that it is already a bronze medal day for Canada at uh, the Olympics. I will not say where and how on this one. Uh, because it just happened today and people may not have had a chance to see it yet, so I won't spoil it. But there is uh, a medal today. Um, we have uh, Felix Ogiel Asim, who's uh, on the tennis courts right now uh, facing Carlos Alcaraz. Uh, he had an amazing day yesterday. Now, he's been having an amazing tournament, actually. Uh, he had to get through at number five, world number five, and former world number one, Daniil Medvedev, uh, the day before yesterday. And he was 0-7 career against him and did that. And then yesterday, he had to get by world number nine, and probably over the past two years, consistently the best player on clay other than Nadal, Kasper Ruud from Norway, and he did do that in three sets. Um, but then yesterday, he also had to play a mixed doubles match, and uh, apparently there he had the option for more rest before the match, uh, but he didn't really take it because he didn't want to be up too late because he had his match, uh, this is singles match today. Um, I'm not sure if that was the most judicious decision. I mean, it was the decision to make to put the best chances on his side uh, to get uh, a medal in singles or to advance, I should not say get, to get the medal, uh, but to um, advance to the final on singles uh, because he is top of the, uh, in top four. So yesterday, uh, so today, win or lose, he will get another match. Uh, so this one is to decide whether or not he gets to play for gold or gets to play uh, for bronze. Um, but then he got to his mixed doubles match, and he might have run out uh, of steam a little bit. So he and Gabriela Dabrowski uh, got off to a great start. They were up 3-0 in the first set, uh, but then it kind of got away from them. Uh, so they uh, they did lose that one. Uh, but that one was a semifinal, so he was guaranteed to get a chance to play for bronze regardless with that. Uh, but today, he is uh, maybe still currently on court, or the match may have finished uh, with uh, former world number one, currently world number three, uh, I think four-time Grand Slam winner now, Carlos Alcaraz. And yeah, um, may have caught up with him because uh, Alcaraz made a rather quick work of Ogier Yassim uh, winning in straight sets of 6-1-6-1. Which, uh, dis while disappointing for an opportunity for golden singles, still leaves him alive uh, for an opportunity at bronze and does uh, manage resources and energy a little bit for his second match of the day. Now, I'm not exactly sure why the Olympic. Well, I'm guessing it's because the players probably have to get back on tour after the Olympics, so the, uh, the tennis schedule is a little compressed but uh, compared to the Olympic schedule. But uh, having to play... Uh, 
singles and uh, mixed doubles on the same day within hours of each other uh, or minutes of each other uh, two days in a row uh, will be a little tough. But uh, he's playing for the bronze medal uh, today uh, in l less than an hour, I think, uh, with Gabriela Dabrowski against um, a team of Kulaf and Schurz from uh, the Netherlands, um, who are um, both pretty good uh, players. Uh, I believe that Schurz is a double specialist in her own right. Uh, so it could be uh, a very thrilling matchup. If uh, Felix Ojeda-Juliassim has uh, saved some energy for it, uh, he might be uh, wearing a bronze medal around his neck uh, by the end of the day and still have an opportunity for another one tomorrow. And uh, so would Gabriela Dabrowski. And if that is the case, uh, if you watched our episode with uh, Devin Haru, when I said uh, you might want to watch out for Gabriela Dabrowski as a medal hope, and he said, that's true, we don't talk much about tennis, my prediction might come true. Uh, Kitland M says, Felix looked tired this morning. I didn't get to watch any of the match. So, um, yeah. Right. So I am not going to uh, give any spoiler about, uh, like I said, the bronze medal result today. But there is a bronze medal. Uh, yesterday, uh, we had a boxer as well uh, who won a match and uh, made it so that he would qualify uh, for a medal fight. Uh, and in boxing, uh, like in judo, uh, the bronze, uh, they offer two bronze medals. Uh, in some sports like tennis, you, they actually play a bronze medal match and one of the two doesn't get, uh, doesn't get a medal. And then, uh, the ones that uh, have a repechage, uh, where they determine, uh, the two people who will be fighting for bronze through repechage, both of them do get the bronze, uh, when they fight. Um, so, uh, this boxer, and I wish I could remember his name off the top of my head, um, will be the first Canadian boxer in 22 years, 22 years, to be able to bring home a medal uh, from the Olympics. So uh, his name is Wyatt Sanford. Uh, so he guaranteed himself a medal position yesterday uh, by winning his bout. So that is uh, pretty exciting uh, in the world of boxing because our boxers have had a bit of a tough time um, we didn't have that many in the Olympics, but we did have one named Tamara Thibault, who fought the other day, who's the 2022 world champion and was uh, a good bet for gold. Um, and she unfortunately was upset in the first round. Um, but it turns out it was all good because she was uh, upset uh, by an athlete that was uh, competing for the uh, refugee Olympic team. And uh, if you were able to see it, there was a beautiful, beautiful moment. Uh, of sportsmanship, a gorgeous moment of sportsmanship uh, where she was, well, I mean, right after the match, like while she was in the ring, um, she basically gave credit. Uh, you know, you could see she was giving credit to her opponent uh, for the win. But uh, afterwards, um, she was being interviewed and uh, this person came along and she, uh, she stopped the interview. And they had a beautiful, beautiful, long uh, embrace where um, Tamara Thibault wished her uh, the best in the continuing the fight and was basically uh, like congratulating her and, you know, hoping that... Uh, everything would uh, would work well well for her. Um, and I mean, like when I talk embrace, sincere embrace. Like they held each other for a good while. Uh, kisses were exchanged. Um, and the, you could tell that uh, they were friends. You could really tell that they were friends uh, because the boxer from the refugee team was uh, sitting there and, basically saying like, why, <laughs> why, <laughs> why, why did it have to be this way? Why did it have to be against you? And, you know, it was just one of these absolutely gorgeous moments. And then we uh, saw another one as well in, in gymnastics uh, when Ellie Black and uh, I believe Ava Stewart, I think, no, or Shannon Olsen or Olin, from the gymnastics team uh, 
were seen consoling uh, a gymnast, I believe, from France, whose uh, last name was Dos Santos, uh, who was a very strong metal hope, and uh, she had a bit of a tough competition. And uh, you can see them uh, also, you know, um, given the pep talk and embracing on that one, you couldn't really hear what they were saying all that much. But they were just gorgeous moments of sportsmanship. And considering, you know, everything that's been said about Canadians with regards to the soccer issue, um, these were moments that we, we needed to see that were important to see. And uh, they were moments that made me very, very, very proud uh, to be Canadian as I was watching that. Uh, hopefully, uh, there you go, Miss uh, Kits and Cubs. I will, there are some images here. Of course, I don't have sound, but uh, there you have, you see um, Shannon Olson and Ellie Black here consoling Melanie de, Melanie de Jesus de Santos after she had a disappointing qualification day for French gymnastics there. And um, so, and I mean, this is uh, a minute and 24 long. So they were really there. You see, she's got her hands on her shoulder and it's like, like, you know, it's, looks like she's saying, you know, you are good, right? Do you know you're <laughs> So you can see that. And uh, Shannon, every now and then you can see, well, well, we'll put her hand out and, you know, wipe a tear that's streaming from her face. And, uh, these are just gorgeous moments. And then, you know, Melanie is able to break out into a couple of smiles uh, over the course of that. And then see more, uh, more consolation there. And then uh, we're talking about uh, uh, the other two. Uh, I will try to find some images of that too, because I have that not, uh, not that far here. Uh, Tamara Thibault and uh, the boxer Cindy uh, Nagamba was her name. And, uh, have the, the visuals right here where she's uh, giving an interview and you can see um, she's definitely devastated and there we go she just spots her and just the warmth like you can't fake this you can't fake this see kisses embraces she's just it's almost like she's saying you know what if it couldn't be me it absolutely has to be you, and I have. I wouldn't be surprised if she whispered in her ear, "Now, if you beat me, you better go and win that gold for the refugees." It's. This is what it's about. Different countries, different nations. You know. The ecstasy of victory and the agony of defeat, and still, moments after it happens, you can be like that. So you now, when I say stuff like like Canada is a fair play nation. That's the stuff that I mean. That's the reason why that, that's one of these, this is one of the reasons that I love to watch the Olympics is to get those moments. So um, congratulations really to our Canadian athletes who are, uh, you know, putting out the good example out there uh, for them. Um, there are other uh, things that happened uh, in gymnastics, for example, since we're talking about it. Um, Canada had a wonderful Olympics in that it was historic that the men and the women's team both qualified for the team event. I think that might have been the first time in history that that has happened, uh, which is great. Uh, the men finished eighth. I believe the women finished fifth, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, as a team. And uh, yesterday, uh, uh, in the last few days, we had the all-around competitions for the men and the women. And uh, for the men... Things were going really good for a Canadian gymnast named Felix Dolce, Dolce. And then he was on the high bar uh, doing his routine. And uh, gymnasts wear a grip around their wrists, their hands. And while he was on uh, the high bar, um, his grip just snapped while he was in midair. And this man went flying. Uh, it was very scary uh, when it was to see it happen in, in real time. Uh, and uh, you can see um, he wasn't extremely, um, let's just put it this way, it could have been very, very bad injury-wise 
Uh, so no massive uh, injury, uh, but he still did have an, in, an injury to his hand. Um, whoops, I did not show the video the right way here. I'm so sorry. I'm uh, trying to get to the video image. There we go. Um, so yeah, pretty uh, bad damage to his hand uh, when it happened. Um, and uh, in an interview, uh, he was so poised and so together, uh, and he took it like a champ. Uh, later on, uh, at the end of the rotation, uh, finished uh, his routine. Uh, at the point, at that point, he was the, the third rotation. And at the at the end of two rotations, he was actually in a metal position, and it's just. <sighs> So, you I mean, your heart broke for him. Your heart broke for him. But when you see that interview and how he handled himself and how the poise and everything, um, this is a young man that's going places. I mean, and even there, like, as the crowd was giving him, you know, big cheers, he had the sense, you know, to show some love back to the crowd, uh, as we just saw there. Um, he earned a lot of respect, a lot of respect uh, from everybody there. And uh, I will, uh, again, because we don't have sound and whatnot uh, here, but I will still be able to uh, show the video uh, for those who didn't see it. Um, just. A fine young man. As you can see, he literally just went flying. And he didn't have, he just said, you know, while I was in the air, uh, I basically um, just <laughs> thought about not dying, doing what I needed to do to not die. And as you can see, he did not have much time at all to figure out how to uh, get himself uh, out of the way in order to uh, not fall on his head or snap his neck. Um, yeah, just absolutely fantastic. Uh, so watch out for him. Uh, he's going to be a leader uh, on, on our team. He's going places. Um, in the women's all-around competition, uh, Ellie Black uh, was a candidate uh, for one of the medals, and she too was doing very well, and then she got on the balance beam and uh, you know how I say sometimes some people, uh, when they get uh, a chance to win, uh, they compete not to lose rather than competing to win? She competed to win. So she got on the balance beam, uh, which is one of her best apparatus. And uh, she uh, upped the degree of difficulty. And there was a move that she um, doesn't land all the time. But she had the choice of you know, toning down the degree of difficulty and hoping that maybe other people would have some mistakes and, you know, she would go through or to up the degree of difficulty and really go for it. She did. It unfortunately didn't pay off. Uh, she fell off the beam. Uh, so that's an immediate one point deduction and that pretty much will kill, uh, your chances, um, in gymnastics. Uh, and after that she had slid down to 10th place and still continued competing and managed to get herself all the way up to sixth. So again, you know, that tenacity and the never quit. And uh, yes, we fell, but uh, I will not let that deflate me. And I uh, picked up a sixth place uh, in the all around. So uh, congratulations to our athletes who are, uh, you know, even in moments like this, who are showing wonderful examples of how it is uh, to be and how to handle these situations. On the biggest stage, you know, with billions of people watching, with all the cameras, um, said so when I say that our athletes are exceptional ambassadors, they really, really are. So, um, then we had Evan Dunphy, uh, who was a bronze medal uh, winner, I think, I believe in the 50 kilometer race walk in the last, uh, in the previous Olympics, who was participating in the 20 uh, and ended up fifth. Uh, and he was saying just at the end, he just didn't have enough extra speed to be able to catch up. And he too, if you listen to an interview, he was just so happy to be there and happy to, to perform well. Um, 
unfortunately, they took the 50 kilometer uh, race walk out of the Olympics. So uh, he will not have the opportunity to compete in his uh, best event uh, because it's no longer a, an Olympic discipline. So uh, that was the end of his Olympics. Um, our fencers, once again, uh, did something absolutely amazing. It was the team competition. And uh, in the first round, uh, our Canadian fencers, which were ranked number six out of the eight teams, were playing France, which was ranked number three. And again, fencing in France, the land of fencing against France. And they upset them, which was absolutely spectacular. So uh, then they had to play the United States, which was uh, ranked second. And the United States did win, uh, which sent our fencers to uh, the bronze medal bout against Japan. And they lost by one. One. Fourth place by one touch, one hit in fencing. Uh, but an absolutely fantastic result uh, for our fencers. And uh, hopefully these results will get uh, the federal government to throw some more money into the program because uh, we've got something going on here, specifically our women and our women's foil team. Uh, so congratulations to them. The big news, of course, is... Uh, Summer, <laughs> summertime, and the swimming is speedy. <laughs> uh, she did it again, uh, picking up her second gold medal uh, of the Olympics, becoming the first Canadian female to ever become double gold at an Olympics uh, in the 200-meter fly. And uh, she has qualified first for the 200-meter IM, so she'll be uh, swimming that. And I believe Cindy Pick Sydney Pickram will also be in the final of the 200 IM today, so I need to watch out for that. Um, then uh, our swimmers got together for the 4x200 uh, relay, and once again, another fourth in the pool. <laughs> So uh, we're, we're doing really well uh, picking up fourth places. Um, but uh, again, uh, uh, the gap between third and fourth was, uh, was large enough that um, it wasn't uh, an oh-so-close by a couple of seconds. There was a, the, the top three in that uh, race uh, were head and shoulders, the top three. Uh, but it's still a fourth place, uh, and a lot of uh, the swimmers on that team were, are young and will be coming back, so uh, we need to watch for them. Uh, I see that Kit uh, Johnny was with us uh, and uh, has to go for a little bit, so uh, we'll wish you a wonderful day. And uh, Johnny, uh, if you are still here and listening, uh, I really uh, wanted to come to the event on the 27th, and uh, unfortunately uh, there were some events at home uh, that made it such... Uh, that uh, our plans for the evening suddenly had to change. Uh, I'm really sorry. I would have loved to have been at uh, your event. Uh, for those who don't know, Johnny Cohn is part of a band called Laser Bear, uh, which if you have the opportunity to look them up, please do, uh, to support uh, their music. Um, but yes, they were doing a live show, and uh, my full intention was to go. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, there were things that we needed to tend to at home, and uh, I couldn't make it. But I do hope that your event was wonderful, and I do look forward to seeing you live uh, very soon. All right. Um, so I think those were the big things going on. Uh, there's a couple of other things. The, the Cathlon has started today, uh, where Davian Warner is defending his gold uh, medal. Uh, after uh, three events, he was in second place. Um, so uh, the morning events, there's still two more events this afternoon, then a whole day tomorrow. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. Um, the Olympic gods also, you know, when you say um, taketh and giveth away, in the pool, we were talking the other day about Maggie Smith, who um, decided to pull out of the semifinal of the 100-meter free. And people were saying, oh, darn. Well, the Olympic gods gave away because in the, I believe it was the 50-meter freestyle, Josh Leando had finished ninth in the semifinals and only at the top eight advance, which means that he was out. But somebody in the 50 free withdrew from the final, which means that he got bumped up. So he actually has a chance again today uh, to uh, go for gold in uh, the 50 meter uh, free. Uh, he and uh, Ilya Karun, who had won a bronze in the 
200 fly if i'm not mistaken are also uh, going to be competing i believe it is in the final of the 100 meter fly the 100 meter fly is Lindo's better event and uh, karuna did well in the 200 so maybe he does well in the 100 so uh, we have some uh, opportunities there for some uh, extra medals in the pool um so we need to watch out for them as well uh i believe uh, there are more as well i believe in the 200 im uh summer macintosh as i mentioned and cindy pickram uh, will be there as well um so that's happening and that there might be a couple of uh, other things as well um not having as much fun so far these olympics um is the Canadian women's basketball team ranked fifth in the world, but uh, have lost their first two matches and have really been having uh, counter performances. Uh, yesterday they were playing against Australia and uh, they missed so many baskets and they missed so many free throws. Uh, they rallied well at the end and only lost by five, which, you know, if you think you know, you've missed about 11 free throws, uh, well, there's the win right there. So uh, they have one more match to play against Nigeria. Nigeria had actually upset France. Uh, so this is a must-win game uh, for them to be able to uh, go forward to the next round. But uh, they have been having uh, some, uh, like I said, a, a little more difficulty. And uh, you can tell there was an interview with uh, one of the Canadian players. And she was really, really poised uh, at first. And then uh, at one point, um, the emotion overwhelmed her. Uh, and you can see her, um, you know, start to, to well up and uh, sort of like shake her head and sort of like, like I, I, I can't go on with this interview. I'm, you know, I'm going to pretty much break in front of everyone. And uh, when it comes to the basketball team, uh, there was an article in the National Post today uh, that goes, Canada fired the wrong coach. Canadian Lisa Tamaitis thriving at the Olympics with Germany. And the article goes, uh, Lisa Tamaitis was pushed out as the head coach of Team Canada's women basketball team after the last Olympic Games. In retrospect, that was probably a mistake. Tamaitis has coached 19th-ranked Germany to the playoff round of the women's basketball tournament at the Olympic Games. Meanwhile, Victor Le Pena, who replaced Tamaitis, has coached 5th-ranked Canada to one game away from round-robin elimination in the Olympic women's basketball tournament. Oddly, both Germany's men's and women's basketball teams are coached by Canadians. The undefeated men's team is headed up by former Raptors assistance coach Gord Herbert, who led Germany to a surprising gold medal at last summer's FIBA World Cup. Oddly, both Canadian teams are coached by Spaniards, and so far, Jordi Fernandez coached men's teams are unbeaten in two games. But the Canadian women have been a grand disappointment here. They lost their second straight game to Australia on Thursday by a 70-65 to score that flattened the Canadians. Team Canada wasn't really in the game much in the second half. They trailed by 12 with less than two minutes to play. They pushed the score close late, which could help them qualify for the playoff round, but only if they beat Nigeria in their next game since Nigeria lost to France on Thursday. Sorry, Nigeria had upset Australia, not France. My mistake. Gentle correction on myself. The Germans, meanwhile, missing their star player, Nayera Sabali, beat Japan 75-64 to remain unbeaten, and many of the players, while walking through the mix zone, credited the turnaround in German basketball to the Canadian coach, Tomaitis. She's been such a large factor for us, said Satu Sabali, who had 33 points for Germany Thursday. Quote, I don't think we're in this position if it wasn't for her. She's brought a real sense of purpose to our program. Tomaitis, who was ostensibly fired after the Tokyo Olympics, didn't figure another national team opportunity would come her way after Team Canada said goodbye. Quote, it's bizarre how this all happened. The University of Saskatchewan coach said Thursday, I got a call when I was on vacation. Would you be interested in coaching the German Olympic team? It didn't take me long to say yes. Apenna, the Team Canada coach, has little clear explanation for why his team seemed ill-prepared for their tournament opener against France, but played slightly better against a tougher opponent against Australia. Still, when the game got close, Canada had few answers for Australia. Quote, In these moments, we have to take a breath and be patient, said the coach. They may take a breath and be patient and be out of the Olympics before you know it. That's rather heartbreaking for Team Canada cap captain Natalie Anchonwa, in her fourth Olympic Games, she believed this team was ready to compete. It hasn't necessarily shown that in two losses. And typical of a veteran, she blamed herself. Quote, you can't miss four three rows of free throws in a tight game, she said. I'm better than that. The Olympics for this Canadian group is bigger than that, even if it hasn't looked that way here. Quote, to know we're representing Canada, she said, we do that regardless of the score, regardless of the outcome. We do that with how we show up and how we continue to show up. 
I know if I leave everything on the floor, if we play like we played today, I'd be proud to look at any Canadian in the face and say, I represented you well. In the loss to Australia, Canada was led by Bridget Carlton with 19 points, which tied the Aussies' top scorer, Sammy Whitcomb, in a game high scoring. The Aussies shot 48% from the field, way better than the Canadian number of 35. Kia Nurse, who was second in scoring for Canada, hit on just three of 14 shots. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what happened. So, hopefully, uh, the match against Nigeria will go better for the team and uh, that will give them some energy uh, for the playoff rounds because there is still time to turn it around. Right? It's not over. So, you can't, uh, can't get down on yourself. You just have to come out for the next match and then, uh, you know, give all you got and uh, regroup. So hopefully that will uh, work well for them. Um, that's all I've got from the Olympics for this moment. There was a lot of news. <laughs> but that's because our athletes uh, are, are just doing so well. They're doing so well. They're making so much history and uh, they are performing well. Um, so, uh, and uh, we ought to be uh, quite proud of them. Um, all right. We will move on to uh, some politics. <laughs> it seems that uh, the Conservative Party of Canada has uh, somebody else that has decided that they want to run for a nomination. And um, who it is is kind of interesting. It's Andrew Lawton from the other True North, the one that doesn't have it, the best damn fam in all of podcasting. Uh, he has decided that he wants to throw his hat in the ring. According to the CBC, uh, he will be seeking a nomination and uh, a London, Ontario area writing. Uh, quote, an opportunity arose, and I reflected on it with family. I prayed on it. Please. And I've reached the decision I'm sharing with you now, Andrew Lawton said Wednesday on his eponymous radio show. I've spent my whole career advocating for conservatism, for freedom, for common sense, he said. As I've looked at the political landscape, I've thought about the way that I can best serve. This is an opportunity that I do not want to pass up. Lawton is seeking the nomination in the new writing of Elegant St. Thomas, London South, after Karen Vecchio announced Tuesday she would not be running again. So to the kids in the chat that uh, made the comment, yeah, to be replaced by a white male anti-choice candidate, you were right. You called it. You called it. So yeah. They got uh, Andrew Lawton coming in. Uh, now, now we kind of know why it is that he wrote that, uh, that book on Pierre Polyev this year. Yeah? Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a suck-up job, really, eh? in the year that uh, they are naming or were seeking uh, candidates. So, um, yeah, um, he gave him a full book. That's a lot of PR. And now I'm guessing he's hoping to be rewarded with the nomination. Um, and this, of course, um, Andrew Lawton is uh, one more in a long line of uh, representatives from the, the blatantly pro-liberal media. According to the conservatives, um, who live only to serve Justin Trudeau, along with Carol Ann Meehan, who we talked about the other day, and Jamil Giovanni, who is running now, and Sabrina Maddow, who wanted to, but they didn't want her. I guess she wasn't uh, anti-choice enough, maybe, for their liking. Um, and, uh, well, Pamela Wallen, and Peter Kent, and Mike Duffy. But yes, tell us again how the media is all unabashedly biased uh, towards the liberals and uh, uh, carrying Justin Trudeau's water because the federal government supports media with money. Because uh, I don't know about you, but uh, all the journalists, whether actual ones or self-professed, seem to be running for the conservatives. Maybe Sabrina Maddow should have written a book instead of articles. Oh, sorry. 
That might have been a little petty. <laughs> yes, once again, another parachuted. Well, no, not a parachuted person because he's actually going to, he's not the nominee. He's going to compete for the nominee. It's like a Tracy Foran. She's not the nominee yet. Apparently there's, at present, there's a race. Of course, a party can cut a race in the middle, like we saw in La Salle, uh, uh, La Salle et Mar Verdun, uh, when uh, the nomination race had already started and candidates had already, prospective candidates had already uh, started work getting signatures and then found out somebody was going to be parachuted in. Um, so at the moment, there seems that there is going to be actual races in these two districts for these two people. But uh, it seems that um, these conservative aspiring nominees um, are taking a trip uh, or I've taken a tip from uh, what's going on in the United States. You know, um, Donald Trump, of course, keeps on saying that he uh, gets the best people, the absolute best people. Uh, and if you want a job in Donald Trump's government, it seems that the best way to do it is to go on Fox news and uh, start saying all these things about Trump that are elogious and you know flattering and kind and uh, that pump him up and you know he sits there and watches who is this person I like the cut of their jib I'm going to name them as my vice president that's not working out well either for him by the way um, it seems that on that one uh, he's got about to two more days if he's going to ditch him before uh, J.D. Vance becomes locked in on uh, the ballot with him. So uh, pay attention to that. But uh, yeah. So we have uh, Tracy Foran, who's all over the internet trying to get some name recognition by basically slagging everyone and showing what a good little soldier she can be. And hopefully that will secure the nomination. And well, well, we already know that Andrew Lawton's a good little soldier. He's got all those hours of uh, media to prove it, but he actually went out and wrote a book about PP. Um, yeah. So it seems that uh, that's the way uh, people think that the way to get PP's attention is to um, be as much like him as possible and show that uh, they have no uh, reservation about saying the wildest things about others and uh hopefully uh they'll get noticed and uh, uh if they're really really lucky uh, they'll get appointed to to run in a conservative safe seat which means uh, they would keep getting paid very handsomely for doing little to no work because when you're a conservative mp uh, it seems that your job is to just uh, blow sunshine up the leader's butt and repeat what he says. And if you can do that, it's a little bit like Jerry Boyle, right? If you can mark an X, you're my kind of people. If you can repeat what I say just to own the libs, you're my kind of candidate. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm not impressed with this guy. Uh, Lawton says that he will take an on-air break leave of absence from his show, as well as his role of editor for True North uh, while he is doing this. So, uh, but this is not Lawton's first foray into politics. In 2018, he did run for the Ontario Progressive Conservatives and faced some criticism for some past comments that he had made uh, on his website. He says that if elected, he will, quote, fight tirelessly for the writing, advocate for free speech. If Mr. Grizzly was here, it's freedom of expression, you dumbass. We don't have freedom of speech and against medical aid in dying for people with mental illness, and, of course, defund the CBC. Because in his case, that's not at all a conflict of interest. Just, <laughs> God, these people. <sighs> that whole defund the CBC thing, I don't get where they think that this is a vote-getter for them, because given that recent polling shows that the CBC is the second most trusted source of information in the nation after the Nether Weather Network, and it's trusted by 67% of Canadians, just seems to be that uh, wanting to defund something that 67% of Canadians trust 
does not seem um, like a smart political move, and it doesn't seem like it's a move uh, that works well for people who understand how numbers work. They have problems with words, and they have problems with numbers. Again, I don't understand these people. All I can do is report about the what seemed to me very, very, very odd choices that they make. But there you go. Uh, Andrew Lawton is getting back into politics. He's going to try to secure the nomination. And uh, I guess we'll have to see how that works out for him. But uh, given that he has a lot of name recognition and fans, uh, I'm guessing that he is more likely to secure it uh, than Tracy Foran is at the moment because she doesn't uh, she doesn't really have much profile, and the profile that she has was pretty much all negative. Andrew Lawton, don't ask me why, but has fans and contributors and all that kind of stuff. So I would say that he's probably more likely. The question would then just depend on whether or not the Conservative Party of Canada wants to spend uh, a lot of time in the lead-up to the election and potentially in the election uh, mopping up for some of his past comments. Pardon me. Mm, sorry, had to yawn there. Uh, but yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, if, if I was uh, running these campaigns, these are candidates that I would say, like, uh, I'm. thank you for your interest, but no. No, we, we, during the campaign, we need to focus on the campaign and you are, there's either something in your past or something current going on in your present. Uh, so I passed a Bozo eruption statement or one that's going to come out because uh, they seem to come a mile a minute out of you. Again, looking at you, Tracy, um, that is going to make it such that, uh, it's only going to be distracting for the general overall campaign. And, uh, thus, um, we can't have you. But we're not dealing with a normal conservative party anymore. So um, what it is that they are specifically looking for and how much liability they are willing to take is up to them. Because in their case, uh, that which is a liability uh, for some under conventional political wisdom uh, for them is a great way to make sure that the base comes out. And if they think that they have the bigger base, then they're not really worried about liability. They're just worried about giving the base all the red meat it needs to motivate it to come out, which involves saying things that would normally make you a liability. But in that party, and with the media that we have, somehow does not. Again, I can't explain it. I can just tell you that it's happening. Uh, yes. Yes, Kit Saucy, Mark Burry, and Max Fawcett had uh, some really interesting comments on Andrew Lawton. And uh, he too got bla uh, blocked by Tracy. <laughs> by the way. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Not great. Not uh, great at all here. Um, in the chat yesterday, I also uh, noticed some people asking me a certain question based on that which was going on in the United States. Um, Donald Trump did something I did not actually expect him to do. Um, he went, there was a, I guess, a gathering of uh, the National Association of Black Journalists in the United States. And... Um, he was invited, as were other people, and uh, oddly enough, he decided to show up. Again, not exactly sure why it is he would have decided to go there, but I'm guessing that he thought that he could do something good there. And uh, I wish I could show, again, because I don't have the capacity to show clips with audio, I can't uh, show you what was said. Um, but Basically, um, the moderator of the event uh, started 
Apparently, the event started, according to Trump's, the event started about 35 minutes late because there was some technical stuff. Apparently, while that triggered him, he found that that was disrespectful towards him, that things started late. Um, he was supposed to be for an, there for an hour. The host actually said, you know, the moderator said, you know, thank you for being with us for this hour. And um, she basically started with, you know, in the past, you've said this and said this and said this and said that and said this, you know, what makes you think that there, there are some votes for out there for you? I'm sort of paraphrasing the question because I don't have it to word for word here uh, with me. Uh, and then uh, it's, you know how I've been mentioning a lot that uh, Pierre Polyev has been imitating Trump? Well, in this case, um, Trump imitated Pierre Polyev. Um, he really went after her. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing, given that it was the National Association of Black Journalists, that the moderator was also a journalist. And uh, asked, like, like, who are you with, ABC? Sounds very much like, who are you with, CBC? CP? That uh, Pierre does. And just went off, you know, calling them this, that, this, all, of, all things. So according to this article here, political.com here, I found it. Right after Trump shook Scott's hand, that's the last name of the people who was the, the, mod, the person who was the moderator, and took a seat on stage, he lashed out at her for asking the first question of the panel, quote, why black voters should trust the former president when he has used language such as animal, rabbit, and loser to describe black politicians and journalists. Quote, well, first of all, I don't think I've ever been asked a question in such a horrible manner. The first question, you don't even say hello, how are you? Are you with ABC? Because I think they're a fake news network, a terrible network. And then just you know, said that it was a very rude introduction. Why would you do something like that? I think it's a very nasty question. Again, with all the things that he said about black people, he went to the NABJ and expected nasty women to behave like nice girls. To him. <sighs> it just... <laughs> oh my God. So yeah. Um, yes, no moderator. It was an interview technically, but one person was the lead. So that, that's why I'm saying moderator in, in this case. But yes, the, the, all three of them were indeed uh, journalists. Um, and then, you know, made his famous claim again that he's been the best president for the black population since Abraham Lincoln. Um, yada, 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 yada. Uh, it was an absolute uh, terrible performance. And then, of course, uh, birtherism 2.0 started. And um, according to the article, when ABC News' Rachel Scott asked Trump whether he thought it was acceptable for some of his Republican colleagues to label Harris a DEI hire, Trump kept demanding that Scott define DEI, even after Scott responded, diversity, equity, inclusion. Now that's another thing, right? So what do you mean by that? The term is vague. Yeah. With the rate at which they say DEI and DEI hire, they know very well what it is. They do not need the term defined for them because they work so hard to redefine the term for their own face. But he's pretending like he doesn't know what it means or it can mean 75,000 different things and that she had to be really specific about what it was. And then Trump attacked Harris, who is of Indian and Jamaican descent, over her identity. Quote, and once again, because I'm reporting it back, I have to say these words, but I cannot believe that I'm about to say these words. Quote, she was always of Indian heritage, and she was only promoting Indian heritage. I don't know she was black until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black, and now she wants to be known as black. So I don't know. Is she Indian or is she black? I respect either one, <laughs> but she obviously doesn't because she was Indian all the way, and then all of a sudden she made a turn and went and went made a turn, and she went. She became a black person. He added, suggested someone should look into Harris's identity. <sighs> Kamala Harris went to Howard University, which is a historically black university, college, and universe. Right? 
I don't think she went there just last year. It's been a while. But according to him, she's been identifying as Indian first all along and has never identified as black until just now. Until she turned black. Which caused some people to ask me, jokingly, when did I turn black? <laughs> Which I have to say, cheers. I really appreciated that one, by the way. <laughs> that was well played. And to be totally honest, I'm going to have to actually think about that because I live in Canada. So um, it hasn't really been an issue for me, to be totally honest. Uh, I mean, I do remember once or twice being in the store and then all of a sudden having uh, noticing that uh, some employees of the store were following me. That seems to be a common thing. Maybe that's the day I turned black. But uh, nobody's ever called me the N-word to my face. Then again, a lot of people can't figure out that I'm black unless I actually tell them, or at least part black, I should say. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> it's just... Um, so yeah, uh, Kits and Cups, I'll have to think about that when it is that I decided I was going to turn black. Uh, but you have lots of people turning around and saying, you know, uh, making comments about when they turn black. And it was sort of like, I think it was after the 13th time that I was stopped driving my car. So, yeah. So once again, uh, he wants people to prove their nationality and people are doing stuff like this. Well, she's not a natural born citizen because her parents weren't born in the United States. No, her parents are not natural born citizens, but she was born in Oakland. And last I checked, Oakland was in California. So being a natural born citizen doesn't mean that you have to have X number of generations prior to you born in the United States. It just means only you. <laughs> so uh, they're trying a whole bunch of stuff to make it fit. And I guess they're trying to pit Indian Americans versus um, Black Americans. I'm guessing, guessing they think that maybe there's a rift between each of them. Uh, now, this is an odd choice because um, of the Asian American and Pacific Islander demographic, uh, the largest Asian alone demographic group in all the United States recently became people from India. They are the most populous. And they literally threw that vote under the bus. And the black vote under the bus. And then the other day, uh, Trump came up and said something like, uh, Schumer is now a member of Hamas. Chuck Schumer's Jewish, so there goes the Jewish vote. And then you have uh, J.D. Vance saying all those things about single people. So there goes the single people vote. It's almost like they don't want anybody to vote for them, oddly enough. I do not understand the strategy at all. But I will point out that uh, while, uh, again, while people are demanding to see birth certificates, uh, we still haven't seen Trump's medical report about his ear. And not the regular one the long form one. Can we get your long form medical report, Donald? I just, <sighs> yeah, Kitlin them. They also posted a picture of her when she was young wearing a sari with along three other Indian women in her family. Lovely picture. But they're saying, see, see, she was always Indian. They seem to have Difficulty uh, mastering the concept of mixed race. That you can be both. And that um, being one doesn't prevent you from being the other. They also seem to have a problem with code switching. Isn't it weird that Kamala on a dime can... Kamala on a dime could start speaking one way to one group and another way to another group. It's like, we all do it. We all code switch. We all code switch. 
when I speak French. I have my very, very clean French. Yes. And then I have my street French. Different contexts, different level of language as a gay man. I have how I speak every day as a gay man. And then I have how I speak when I'm camping it up. Everyday people, when you go to the corner store and when you go to a job interview, you code switch. You code switch. You speak differently. It's not new. It's adapting our language for the situation, the audience for whom we're speaking. But apparently, it's weird for them. They, they, they can't understand it. That's something to be criticized. So, yeah. They are... Um... Oh, boy. Yeah. And we've got months to go before November. This is going to get ugly. Uh, but none of it seems to be working for them. So that's kind of good. Uh, the other big news uh, that we're waiting on here is uh, the announcement of Kamala's VP choice. And it seems that this will come on Tuesday of next week. Um, the announcement will be made in Pennsylvania, which is letting some people to speculate that it might be Josh Shapiro. Uh, but then again, uh, President Joe Biden just posted something on his Twitter feed saying that he considers Peter Buttigieg, that Buttigieg reminds him a lot of his son. Which would lead people to believe that it might be Buttigieg. Uh, apparently, uh, there are certain things with regards to uh, whether or not uh, the candidate is going to be a governor uh, that need to be done by a certain uh, um, time or something. Uh, that makes it such uh, the, the counter argument to oh it's definitely going to be Josh Shapiro is that it's uh, this this type of thing and if that's not done by a certain time then there's no way it could be um, sorry not not governors uh, senators that it couldn't be Mark Kelly uh, if something is not announced by a certain time um, it's speculation and I've been listening to both the fifth column on this one and uh, in this case Pry and I agree with him Pry's it's good. Just the longer that they can drag it out, uh, I guess the more that they can have buzz, will it be this person, this person? All of this is positive press for her. Um, so the, the VP or the VP stakes at the moment is actually playing in a Kamala's favor. And uh, like, let's be serious. She's got an embarrassment of riches to choose from. Right? There's a, a guy from Minnesota named Tim Walls who I didn't know much about until about two or three weeks ago. But every time I see him, he's just rocking it. I mean, uh, Kelly in Arizona would be great. I mean, he's a former astronaut. I mean, that's always great on a ticket. Uh, Josh Shapiro, uh, I'm told, is Jewish and comes from Pennsylvania, which is a swing state, so there's a case to be made for him. Uh, Pete Buttigieg, adding someone who's rainbow to the ticket. You really want to get the kids out, the under 35 vote. That would be a good way to do it, and plus he's an effective communicator, and he has a military background, which shores up some stuff. Um, there are lots of people. You could pick Gretchen Whitmer and have a, a double female ticket. Make history that way. There are, um, yeah, Tim Walls is also a teacher. Um, yeah. So um, they are saying that the event being in Pennsylvania only has to do with the schedule, and that's where they wanted to kick it off. In Pennsylvania because it's a swing state, but you shouldn't necessarily read into it the fact that it will be Josh Shapiro. We'll have to wait to see what it is, but uh, all these things have people writing press about her, talking about her. It moves Trump off uh, the main headline, uh, so maybe that's why he went to the National Association of Black Journalists, because he wasn't really in the news all that much. He wasn't driving the narrative as he normally does. And, well, he can't stand that. So he went there and said things out, things that were outrageous, got a few headlines. But um, even though those things happened, it's still not changing the narrative away from Kamala 
and uh, the amount of money that she's raising and the amount of volunteers that have signed up already and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, like I said, uh, it'll be interesting once she names uh, her candidate to see what happens, and it will also be interesting to see if uh, the Republicans ditch their vice president candidate within the next few days. However, again, as both the fifth column says, that would mean Trump having to admit he made a mistake. So JD might be here to stay. <laughs> uh, K- Elaine, yes, uh, you say, uh, I might be mistaken, uh, but I believe Gretchen said no. Uh, indeed, Gretchen said specifically that uh, she didn't want, she did not want to be considered. But then again, you know, if you get the call, you get the call, right? And then you do have to consider, uh, and that might change things. So uh, there you go. That's sort of what's going on stateside. There's a whole bunch of other stuff, but that's sort of like the main big stuff that's going on. Um, there's other stuff uh, that uh, Bob Goodguy, uh, who was running for the nomination, uh, but uh, that Trump had a personal vendetta against because he had a, uh, supported DeSantis. Uh, he did not win. There was a recount in his vote, and turns out that he did lose by a few hundred, uh, but he will not be on the ballot. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a little developments like that. Uh, uh, Senator Medendez, uh from the Democrats was indeed found guilty of uh, all those things, uh, but not before uh, blaming his wife. Those gold bars in the closet? Those gold bars? No, 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 those were my wives, apparently, was a part of his defense. Um, he was found guilty, and uh, he has announced that he will resign his seat as a senator um, as a result. So um, in New Jersey, they're trying to figure out who it is that they will name to uh, replace him. Um, there's a guy named Kim, last name Kim, who I believe has secured the nomination to run in the next, ele- in the next election as a Senate candidate, and they thought, well, why not him? But apparently he really does not want to be named before uh, the election. Uh, he actually does just wants to run and win it. Uh, because a lot of people might see an advantage of being uh, named interim in the position for the next few months and then go in as an incumbent. Um, but um, he does not uh, want that. So um, they need to figure out how it is they're going to fill that seat uh, for the next uh, few months. Uh, often when this situation comes along, they often consider the spouse of the candidate, but it seems that, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> Mendendez's wife, who I believe was also charged uh, in the case, don't uh, k- take that uh, to the bank uh, on that one, uh, but I believe she was uh, as well. Um, his wife is named uh, Nadine Mendendez. So yes, uh, they were both to be tried. Um, So that probably wouldn't be a good choice. And it seems that uh, she's not interested at all. I would assume that um, uh, she has her hands full right now. But uh, in that case, um, just to sort of uh, mention it, as Menendez was accused, and now found guilty, of having allegedly, well, allegedly, was found guilty, so I guess no longer allegedly, was accused and found guilty of having used his official position to benefit Whale, Hannah, Jose Urebe, Fred Davies, and the government of Egypt in exchange for hundreds of thousands of dollars of bribes to Menendez and his wife Nadine, which include gold bars, cash, and a luxury convertible. Ooh. So, yeah. But... Unlike Republicans, he was found guilty, resigned his seat, and his party was saying, uh, yeah, you got to go. Meanwhile, on the other side of the ledger, the 34-time felon, found guilty felon, not yet convicted because he hasn't received a sentence, because, and deemed to be in civil court a rapist, and of leader of a fake charity and and a whole bunch of other things. Um, Yeah, he's their guy. The parties are not the same in any way, shape, or form. (laughs) 
uh, here in Canada, um, Peter Nygaard. We haven't talked about him on the show yet. Uh, but he's to be sentenced. He was found guilty. He is to be sentenced. Uh, I'm not sure if the sentencing uh, hearing is coming today because I just saw that on the news. Uh, but yes, his sentence uh, will be coming down pretty soon. Uh, sentenced on Friday in Toronto uh, for the sexual assaults. So um, that's going to be a big news when it happens uh, Friday as well. Uh, what else do I have for you here? Um, Pat King. Oh, yes, him. Well, Pat King, uh, interesting thing happened to him. And uh, since we're talking about him, I think it would be a good idea to mention that uh, Cryer Media Network uh, has, I'm going to call it a new correspondent. Um, and her name is Amanda Purdy, who has joined us. Uh, she's written a few articles and has done a, a couple of uh, videos. Uh, but she has been brought on. And um, she has been, uh, right now she's uh, assigned to the Pat King file. And she comes to it really in a really interesting manner. Because here it is, uh, she posted on her Twitter feed, Pat King's TikTok turned tumble from live stream to overnight lockup. Pat King was in for a shock when he found himself stuck in custody overnight yesterday. Just that morning, he was on TikTok Live, confidently telling everyone it was merely a shirty problem and that he'd be out with better bail conditions. Now, uh, on the day that people were expecting Pat King to arrive in Ottawa, Amanda Purdy went to the Ottawa airport. And uh, she put out uh, a video saying that she was waiting there for him and, uh, you know, opening, you know, wasn't sure whether or not uh, he would be detained before he gets, um, what do you put it, uh, before he would cross uh, the doors into uh, the area, the waiting lounge where people wait for uh, passengers that get off the plane, or whether, um, you know, he would be arrested before and she would not have the opportunity. And, uh, well, he posted stuff sort of mocking her, saying, ha ha, you waited for nothing, I'm in Montreal with my lawyer, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, aren't you a stupid, silly girl, you know, for all that kind of stuff. And, yeah, whatever, you know, sort of stunting and flexing. So that's why uh, this particular uh, bit is juicy. Amanda continues, I, uh, I texted someone close to him asking why he'd say that. And then he replied he had a new shirty set at $15,000. I watched Pat stroll into the courthouse at 2.20 p.m., breeze through security, and present himself to the police right there on the spot. He appeared to explain the situation with his lawyer and Stacy by his side. They exchanged goodbyes, and Natasha cheerfully said, See you in a bit, Pat. Like they did that, like they, little did they know that, quote, a bit would turn into a whole lot longer. After that, the police took him downstairs to where Tamara Leach and Chris Barber were, when they were held for their trial, and surprise, surprise, they proceeded to arrest him and slap on the handcuffs. They confiscated all his personal belongings, including his cell phone and wallet. Now, if I thought there was a chance I wouldn't be getting out that night, I would have handed all my stuff over to a close friend like Stacy or even his lawyer, Natasha Calvino. But no, Pat decided to keep everything to himself. Hmm. So the police tossed his cell phone, wallet, keys, lighter, and smokes into a Ziploc bag. I am pretty sure he thought he was just going through the motions and would be leaving that night with his shiny new 15,000 surety. He is still in jail as I write this. And uh, this is time stamped uh, 11.27 a.m. yesterday uh, morning. Why didn't Pat think to hand over his belongings to his lawyer or Stacy? Why give the police your cell phone? Why take this risk? They, brought into, they bought into their own hype and defaming narrative that they couldn't see the glaring issues like, quote, the insignificant breach of social media, and so, as Sophie likes to say. Pat King is scheduled to be back in court on Friday, his birthday. Sidebar, 
Wasn't he in jail for over five months waiting for bail the first time around? How does anyone think breaching those bail conditions will be a walk in the park? Honest question. They kept Dean a sheriff in, sheriff in jail. I feel sorry for all of you being misled about what this is really about. Someone who knows he has eyes on him can't keep his mouth shut. Play a bit of chess here, Pat. Just saying. Also note the lack of punctuation in this text as I was outside dying in the heat and was unable to uh, see, my, see my screen. And uh, there uh, she uh, posts a cap of a text conversation uh, that uh, says, um, why would he say he's going to get bail conditions if Sophie has gone back home? I was for sure convinced that he would be in custody. And then response, I'm not positive. I was told bail was set at 15K. Now, um, when we're talking, she continues. Once Pat was brought into the courthouse at 3.15, his legal counsel, Natasha Calvino, accused me of specifically recording and live streaming the court proceedings. This is the same woman who asked for my help taking notes for the three days Pat was in Ottawa, and on July 24th, she was working on her closing arguments. She knows that I studied to be a paralegal and that I have always adhered to court decorum when reporting. To actually go on record and require me to speak to the judge to assume to assure him that I wasn't doing anything of the sort but merely taking notes on my notepad is quite absurd and retaliatory. I had literally just tweeted that I had no intent internet access and would update everyone when I exited the courtroom because we were in the basement, hence no connection. This woman was more than happy to have me in the courtroom for three days transcribing everything that was happening, which, by the way, I will be releasing today. It's absolutely ridiculous to put my professional reputation on the line publicly. This behavior is not only disgusting, but also constitutes con conduct unbecoming of a professional. And uh, there, she includes um, a message from lawyer Natasha Cavino, stating, Hi, Amanda. Thank you so much for this. I am working on my closing now, but I can't seem to find the notes you took for me Thursday and Friday. Are you able to send them to me, please? Thanks so much. N. So I'm reading this and I'm thinking like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> and then there's more. Just so everyone knows, I never got paid for the work I did. I'm the grifter, eh? But let's not forget why I was there in the first place when everyone keeps asking, why do you keep inserting yourself into Pat's life? I'm pretty sure I was invited by multiple parties not to be defamed, criticized, mocked, and doxed on social media. That's definitely not what I signed up for, and alas, here we are. And then circa July 10th, 2024, she shows a, a screen of um, a live sort of discussion or chat that happens within uh, Twitter. And uh, it's written here, Pat King, Legally Purdy, which is the name she goes by on Twitter, and Jason Leving will discuss the trial. So I am sitting there and I'm thinking, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Like, why is he hating on you now if you were taking notes? So I asked, Amanda, am I understanding correctly that initially there was no antagonism between you, Pat, you, Pat, and or Natasha, but that at some point something changed? And she answered, correct. On July 21st, it had been over two days since I had spoken to or seen Pat or Sophie. Our relationship was over. I had spent three days transcribing notes for Natasha that I never shared publicly, nor was I compensated for. So why would they speak poorly of me after I volunteered three days of my time? I will not allow people who truly love Canada, like his sureties and myself, to be attacked simply because we refuse to go along with the narrative that Pat is trying to create to save his, quote, reputation. Pat, quote, fucked around and found out. If people are being disingenuous, I'm going to call them out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, the person that uh, Cryer Media has uh, that seems to be reporting directly on this, well, um, seems to have some uh, more intimate experience uh, of the case and um, experience of Pat specifically. Uh, thus, his interestingly placed to be able to uh, do the reporting that she's doing at the moment. Um, so yeah, that's going to be a little saucy as that evolves. I'm not sure exactly uh, when uh, I be believe that they must be at a... Uh, are they still... Mm. 
I know that the, the closing arguments have been made, so I guess uh, we're still waiting for the verdict uh, at this moment. Um, when it comes uh, to the closing arguments, uh, what was said here, um, according to the CBC, closing arguments have wrapped up in the criminal trial for one of the leaders who became known as the Freedom Convoy. And okay, yes, the decision is expected in October. So uh, he might be there for a while because I'm guessing Sophie was supposed to be a surety and uh, uh, she went home. <laughs> so uh, that'll be a little different. Uh, interesting. Um, Superior Court Justice Charles Hackland will now weigh the nuances of the overall circumstances in Ottawa during the protest against King's own actions to decide whether or not the law was broken. I am guessing that in this case, um, Pat King uh, opted for a bench trial rather than a jury trial here. Uh, central questions at the trial included what role King played during the three-week protest, to what extent he could be considered a, quote, leader. The court never saw evidence of King honking a horn himself or driving a truck. Prosecutors said they didn't need that because King's other behavior showed he was actively taking part in mischief and other crimes. On his social media, King posted videos that prosecutors used as evidence. They showed him directing supporters to honk horns after a court injunction banned the act, leading a slow roll of trucks by the Ottawa International Airport, and talking about sneaking trucks downtown. Other videos, including some made after the federal government invoked the Emergencies Act, showed King helping trucks block Wellington Street near Parliament Hill and encouraging supporters to sit on the ground if the police began enforcement. Officers who testified said efforts to contact King were made because, quote, he was considered a leader or person of influence. One protester from Western Canada told court how King was, quote, the guide for truckers coming from Alberta and was there to make sure everybody was safe. Another, he said, he felt rebellion was, quote, his duty, and King was, quote, a prominent finger in that rebellion. King was also listed as a contact on the website of one of the main groups organizing the protests. Now, King, in his defense, pointed to others and blamed authorities. Other protest participants said they had no idea who King was until they got to the city or until the protest was over. Calvino also pointed to other people, some of whom were never charged but who played key roles, she suggested King was targeted only because he was a, quote, valuable personality, as he had some 354,000 online followers at the time of the protest. Yes, because that's how we decide who we charge by how many followers they have. Let that sink in. Uh, yeah, that argument's not going to go very far in court with the judge. Uh, she questioned the role authorities played when it came to mitigating the risk of having so many people in vehicles in the downtown core. Quote, knowing that and the volume of persons, authorities not only invited them, they told them where to park, where to stage, where to set up, where to remain, where to overflow, Calvino said. Yeah, the police were doing crowd control. <laughs> That's not a defense. The trial started in May and endured starts and stops before both parties finished calling evidence Friday and made closing arguments. Hours of video evidence, much of it sourced from King's own social media, were entered into evidence by both sides. Other evidence included decibel maps that showed the noise levels, as well as descriptions of how services like transit routes were disrupted. During closing arguments, King appeared on video screen from Red Deer, Alberta, where he lives. King's trial was highly anticipated by supporters and followers of the 2022 protests. He is one of the key convoy figures going through Ottawa courts. If found guilty, any potential jail time for King is a moving target, but prosecutors have made clear he could face up to 10 years in prison. Hackland is planning to deliver his decision on October 4th, 2024, and has ordered King to be there in person. The judge is not playing, kids and cubs. Uh, I believe another defense that uh, Pat King decided to use was a... Uh, uh, it's not that he was staying there against orders. It's uh, that they were trapped there by police. No. No. When police told people it was time to go, uh, they offered them a passage out. He did not take it. Um, according to this, the CBC, July 30th, convoy leader Pat King back in, back, back in bar, sorry, back behind bars. Pat King's trial may have ended last week, but the prominent figure in the convoy protests is back behind bars after turning himself into police amid allegations he breached his bail conditions. King has pleaded not guilty to mischief, intimidation, and other charges for his role in what became known as the Freedom Convoy. During a brief court appearance on Wednesday, the Crown confirmed there was an ongoing investigation and additional charges were anticipated. Ooh, additional charges. 
Yay! After his trial ended, King had broadcast online something he had done occasionally since being released from custody in July 2022. He was given specific permission to do this in order to raise funds for his legal expenses, but is not allowed to comment on the case. In those broadcasts, King discussed the status of his sureties and his plans to sue the government following a possible victory in courts. He also spoke at length about his trial, which is expected to return October 4th for a decision. King arrived at the Ottawa courthouse just past 2 p.m. on Wednesday after shortly, and shortly afterward was led away in handcuffs. King didn't make any comment as he entered the courthouse, but his lawyer, Natasha Calvino, released a statement following his appearance. She said there were allegations King had breached his bail conditions. Quote, Mr. King will be seeking a bail hearing at the earliest opportunity and intends to vigorously defend against any allegations that he breached previous bail conditions, Calvino's statement said. One of the people responsible for monitoring King while he is out on bail also informed the court they no longer wanted to do so. King had been in Alberta and was appearing by video conference for the final days of his trial. By Sunday, word had spread online among King's supporters and followers that he would be turning himself in. On Monday night, King told his supporters he would be traveling to Ottawa and surrendering to police because, quote, of allegations of breach. It's expected King will seek to be released on the bail on bail at first opportunity, which likely isn't until next week. So there you go. That's the latest on him. And um, I do not foresee that this will be a good situation. I mean... There's clearly no show of remorse here. And I cannot imagine that um, that will not factor in as an aggravating factor in his sentencing. The just pure and sure, uh, pure and total lack of remorse. Hey, but we will see. Um, internationally, uh, a really, really big piece of news is, uh, the release of, uh, a whole bunch of people. Well, that, uh, Vladimir Putin had decided to, uh, arrest under flimsy princes, pr- uh, pretenses and keep in jail. And, uh, in what has been described as the biggest and most complex prisoner swap since the Cold War. Um, three Americans jailed in Russia, journalist Evan Gerskovich, uh, Alsu Kormasheva, and former U.S. Marine Paul Whelan, are free after an extraordinary prisoner swap deal struck among the U.S., its allies, and the Russian government, uh, as reported by Nick Schifrin of uh, PBS on this one. Uh, He says, in 80 years of U.S.-Russia and U.S.-Soviet spy swaps, today's was the most complex. Two dozen people, one in Ankara, Turkey. uh, Sorry, two dozen people on one Ankara, Turkey tarmac, Russian dissidents, convicted Russian spies, and detained Americans who will be coming home and spoke to their family members in the Oval Office on a day President Joe Biden calls historic diplomacy. Um, Paul Whelan, who was released from Russia, uh, is quoted... Yeah, I'm sorry, there's a quote without context here, so I'm not quite sure what to, what to make of it. Um, former American Marine Paul Whelan, detained by Russia six years ago. Six years he's been detained. Russian-American Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty correspondent Alsu Kumashera, also, who was sentenced to six years and a half for spreading false information. Uh, both of them posed for photos with U.S. officials, and then they flew home. Also released was American resident and Russian-British activist Vladimir Karamurza. Uh, Karamuza is a Polar Surprise winning journalist and pro-democracy activist who lobbied Congress to create the Magnitsky Act, the U.S.'s most well-known human rights sanctions. He was twice poisoned but kept returning to Russia to try to create the more democratic future he envisioned. Uh, To get them out, the U.S. worked with Germany, Slovenia, Norway, and Poland that held Russian intelligence agents convicted of crimes who are now handed back to Russia, most notably Vadim Krasikov, who murdered a Russian dissident in a German playground. And then the next line, President Vladimir Putin lauded his work to Tucker Carlson. Slovenia is releasing Russian sleeper agents Artem Dultsev and Anna Dultseva, who posed as Argentinians. The administration says their part of today's deal was finally secured in a phone call between President Biden and Slovenian Prime Minister Robert Golub on July 21st, just hour before President Biden withdrew from the presidential race. 
The U.S. is releasing what a senior administration official says are three Russian intelligence officials, each convicted by U.S. courts for cyber crimes, hacking, or sanctions evasion. A U.S. official tells PBS NewsHour the Central Intelligence Agency tried to secure earlier versions of this deal in January 2023. The Slovenian sleeper agents for Whelan in March 2023, the Slovenian sleeper agents, and two other Russian agents for Whelan and Gerskovich. Each was rejected by Russian intelligence, with each time demanding Krasikov. Germany's willingness to send Krasikov began as an attempt to try and release former opposition leader Alexei Navalny. That deal was initially agreed to by President Biden and Chancellor Olaf Scholz in early February. But before Navalny's name could be formally offered to Russia, Navalny died in a Russian penal colony. U.S. officials say they negotiated for months, including a letter from Biden to Scholz, and Germany finally agreed to release Krasikov in return for some of Navalny's former allies in Russian detention, including Lilia Chanysheva and Ksenia Fadeyeva. Russian is also releasing well-known Russian human rights defender Oleg Orlov and political prisoners Sasha Skochelenko and Ilya Yashin, jailed for criticizing the war in Ukraine, all of whom get new lives in Germany. But not all Americans got out. Amy, Army Staff Sergeant Gordon Black, who's been sentenced to nearly four years in prison for theft, will remain in Russia detention, as will American teacher Mark Fogel, convicted and sentenced to 14 years in prison in 2022. His mother, Malfin, met with former President Donald Trump in Butler, Pennsylvania, the same day of his failed assassination attempt. As for those released, Putin welcomed the Russian spies in their family's home, and the American families felt relief. They will soon see their loved ones for the first time in years. So uh, that's a, a huge, huge, huge deal. And one of the reasons that this is particularly huge is, um, well, number one, uh, Donald Trump has been all over the media saying this, you know, they weren't able to get him out. They weren't able to get him out at all, at all. I'll get it done. Now, some of these people have been, were detained while Trump was president and he didn't get it done then. But yeah, I'll get it done and I'll get it done before my first day in office. So it's like, you know, if you vote him in in November, between November and January, he has enough sway with Putin that he will get the job done. Well, um, I will uh, notice, note that uh, it was Biden that got that done and uh, not Trump, uh, which uh, led to some really interesting comments uh, from Trump on the day, uh, which were interesting in that, um, well, I mean, nobody really needed to hear from him um, on that day because the day wasn't about him and he wasn't involved in any way. Uh, but, you know, he has to make everything about himself. Uh, now, it is alleged that Trump publicly told Putin to withhold a prisoner swap until after the election, saying it wouldn't happen unless he was elected. And um, according to uh, this person, uh, Tom Hartman, who's a host of a talk show uh, on Sirius, so I'm guessing another podcast called The Hartman Report, says, uh, Putin is clearly not listening. He's reading the polls and realizes Trump is not going to be our next president, so he has to work with Biden. And that reminded me of a situation uh, back in home, much like Chairman Xi Jinping released Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver, Spaver immediately after Joe Biden won the election because he didn't want to have to save face for the next four years in order to get Meng Wanzhou back. So, and it would seem that um, Trump... Uh, was not happy about it. He said that uh, almost treating it like the swap was a bad thing, which was really interesting. Um, not sure uh, what he thought could be gained from that, but yeah, he went for it. He uh, decided to make some comments uh, about it. And you know, like I said, it's, it's not his day. So Trump now is at the point where his game is not working the way it was 
He's not getting the attention that he used to get. He's not commanding the narrative as he used to do. So when there are things happening um, in which he's not involved, and there are big things, he does something like either comments negatively about them or goes to the National Association of Black Journalists and then makes these types of statements from Kamala in order to get some headlines and some press, some competing headlines and some press. So he's still so focused on winning the nanosecond that he'll say anything, but in all the things that he's saying, he is uh, basically laying the groundwork for attacks against him when the election comes, because all of these things are going to be recycled at some point. They're going to be dredged up, and they're going to show up in an election, and uh, they're going to come back to bite him. So it's not, it's not like he's, he's uh, thinking clearly here. Now, there is a bit of a Canadian connection, because uh, Paul Whelan was actually Canadian born. So Paul Whelan is, uh, I believe, the guy uh, who was a Marine there. Uh, Joe Biden said, today is a powerful example of why it's vital to have friends in this world. So talking about allies, and allies matter. Um, Whelan, 54, was arrested in 2018 and convicted of espionage two years later. He was sentenced to 16 years in prison. Both Whelan and the U.S. government have denied that he's a spy. Born in Ottawa to British parents, he resided in Michigan for more than two decades and served in the U.S. Marines prior to his arrest in Russia. He's a U.S. national who also holds British and Irish passports, and his detention has spanned both the Donald Trump and Biden administrations. Whelan's family expressed gratitude to Biden and everyone who secured his release. Paul, uh, Paul was... Well, held, sorry, quote, Paul was held hostage for 2,043 days, the family said in a statement. His case was that of an American in peril held by Russian Federation as part of their blighted initiative to use humans as pawns to extract concessions, like the release of spies. Gerskovich, and then it goes on and talks about uh, the other uh, people. Gerskovich was a Wall Street journal uh, journalist, um, and he was uh, detained in March 2023 while on a reporting trip to the Ural Mountain city of Yekaterinburg and accused of spying for the U.S. and had been behind bars ever since. Um, so yeah, these are uh, really, really big events. Like I said, if people are um, taking, catching from this, that, uh, that even Putin knows even Putin knows that Trump is not going to win. So he's making the deal now. Um, in Republican circles, that is going to circulate, especially the Republican circles that really, 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 really love Putin. Um, that's going to circulate, and it's going to go through the mill. And... Um, that's not going to be good. That, that's something that's going to be a slow boil undercurrent. That's going to keep things going. And uh, yeah, uh, look for that. This thing about Trump not getting it done. Um, look for Kamala Harris, maybe at some, some point during the campaigns, to even make some type of comment saying, oh, Donald Trump said that he would get it done before the next election. Where were you? Right? And this is going on at the same time as a certain weird Republicans like Nancy Mace are still saying that Biden is MIA. Where is he? Well, now you know. <laughs> now you know, Nancy. Now you know. Oh, uh, man. All right. I think that's enough. I went on way longer than I thought I was going to. I thought I was just going to do like half an hour to 45 minutes more. Uh, but uh, like I said, there's lots of stuff. Listen, kids and cubs, um, we're getting at a point now um, where there are no slow news days, especially with the U.S. election coming up and then a Canadian one coming up. 
Um, but we're also in a situation where, particularly worldwide, yes, one, because there are over 80 elections going on in one year, uh, and you know, specifically, specifically in the United States, and then the dynamic there, and all of that kind of stuff, um, where for the next while, we're probably going to be getting like, on a regular basis, two full months worth of news in two days, <laughs> again and again and again. Um, so try to breathe through it. Uh, try not to get overwhelmed. Uh, if you need to take a media cleanse or social media cleanse every now and then, that, that's quite right. That's quite right because it's like, I keep on liking to say that I do this so that you don't have to. And even I feel like I'm white knuckling it because there's so much, right? And I'm trying to find the right balance of concentrating between Canada and the United States because, you know, we need to tend to our own fires, know what's going on here. But <sighs> what's going on in the United States, just like what was going on in France, just like what happened in the UK, they, these moments are so historic, right? Uh, the entire, uh, the British population having such regret from Brexit leading to a trashing of the conservatives um, in that nation to a point that nobody had ever expected to take them them to take that big a hit. It's it's been a long time since they've been down on the dumps down on the dumps uh, seat wise that badly. And then in France, you know, we had the European parliamentary elections. And then in France, it's, it's a snap election, and then people coalescing in order to stop the far right. Again, so much news. Uh, South Africa, the ANC is no longer has a majority. They have to work with other partners for the first time since the end of apartheid. That is revolving. It just makes the word completely revolve and spin. There were, as we told today, not only was there an assassination attempt on Trump, there were assassination attempts on the leaders of uh, Denmark and I believe Slovenia was the the country, this, um, which almost didn't didn't make the news here at all. I found out about those by reading that article. It's, there's so much news that we don't even hear about other, other assassination attempts. It's crazy. It, it's so fast. So it's enough to make your head spin. It truly is. Exactly, obsessive audio. You've nailed it right on the head. It's insane. So fast. Everybody already forgot about the Trump shooting unless they, unless they bought the assassination edition sneakers. An assassination attempt in normal context would be news for months. For months. It went so fast that we still don't have an official medical report and people have moved on. Don't care. It's... India. Modi is still the prime minister, but he thought he was going to get, he actually said, this is how many seats I'm going to get, and ended up with a minority. He too has to work with other part parties. In Venezuela, uh, the U.S. government uh, decided, has come out and said, uh, we do not recognize Maduro officially as the leader. We recognize the other person as having one, and you need to... Uh, uh, present some vote tally information publicly. And some um, of the nations that are a little more, uh, I, no, I can't say necessarily a lot allied with Venezuela, uh, but the bigger players in the area haven't actually been putting pressure on Maduro to do that. And Maduro is sort of in the, indicating that he will give a little bit of concession on that. But again, you have to look at the quality of the document and the way that they do it afterwards, right? It's not going to be as transparent. But it seems that he's moving a little bit, which, again, is almost unheard of. So when I'm saying that there's, there's news, there is a 
lot of it. There is so much of it. Uh, and when you add to that the speed at which Tiapoliev and the conservatives are putting out uh, misinformation, like, you know, they're talking about the crime rate and all that stuff and, you know, putting a whole bunch of stuff out there. And uh, playing fast and loose with statistics when it comes to that. Um, we had David Mosscroft because uh, that put out something the other day with that. Um, and he's, you know, talking about, he mentioned like when Pierre said that we're talking about the worst crime wave in Canadian history. Uh, he's basically saying that that's BS because you have to read the report. You can take the headline, but you've got to read the report and you've got to find out some stuff. So he says, for example, Last week, Statistics Canada reported that the severity of crime in the country was up on aggregate for the third year in a row, growing 2% in 2023. This is a problem and it ought to be treated as such, though the data is worth reading in detail. As politicians fixate on the headline grabbing crimes, for instance, car theft, hate crimes, and homicide, it's worth asking what the data actually says. Now, if we're talking about crimes going up, yeah, hate crimes are indeed up. So is fraud, extortion, car theft, robbery, and shoplifting. But breaking and entering is down 5%. And while vehicle theft is a rising problem, it's roughly 50% lower than it was 25 years ago. The same can be said for robberies, way down from the 1990s and early 2000s. Homicide, one case of which Pierre Polyev exploited last week to target liberals, was down 14% from 2022. We're not in the midst of the country's worst ever crime spree. Whatever that means. The data doesn't suggest that crime isn't a problem, but it does ask us to consider what is a problem, where, and why. But that's complex, far more complex than a slogan, so we're unlikely to be indulged with any such reflection. Instead, what we get is the conservative misrepresenting crime data for political gain, a cynical, if familiar, maneuver that's unlikely to produce better public policy. Polyev is all in on jail, not bail. The old-school tough-on-crime approach is classic Tory standby, but it doesn't sufficiently reckon with concerns such as whether the party's policies would be constitutional, which they may not be, or what the data even tells us about the effects of current bail policy on recidivism and public safety. Instead of a proper debate or deliberation based on verified information and reasons, we are getting anecdotal interventions from self-interested politicians. If anything, this is disrespectful to the public, to victims of crime, and offensive to anyone who thinks turning a few pages and taking in some information is important before overhauling one of the country's most complex files. Last year, defense lawyer Michael Spratt took Polyev to task for his claim that the liberals and NDP had caused a crime wave, calling it nonsense, and noting that crime data is notoriously complex. Quote, what is clear is that historically speaking, wrote Spratt, we live in one of the safest periods in history. Canada's crime severity index, a measure of the seriousness of police report crime, has decreased by 6% in the last decade and is staggering 31% since 2000. They want you to be afraid. They want you to believe that the reality in which you exist is wildly different than it is. Regardless of the actual statistics, the Liberals took the bait last year and toughened bail conditions. In doing so, they ceded the issue and the frame to the Conservatives in a bid to tackle public threats from repeat offenders with a reverse onus provision that requires the accused to bear the burden of proving they ought to be released. Whether the amendments to the criminal code will work, who knows? Given this country's incapacity to collect and analyze so much critical data, no one not ought to hold their breath. Writing in the Tai last March, former Stephen Harper advisor and criminal law professor Benjamin Perrin argued against Polyev's promise to introduce potentially disastrous American-style mandatory minimum sentences, calling them, quote, a grave policy failure and cheap politics and bringing the data back to up as clean. And remind you that a lot of those mandatory minimum provisions under Harper were overturned by the Supreme Court as being unconstitutional. Making good criminal justice policy requires that we gather and analyze data, spend time deliberating and debating, and leave aside the cheap politics. We'd be far better off having a sustained conversation about the carceral state, the roots of crime, and its social and economic determinants, and how to address these deep and long-standing challenges. That approach, of course, would be the way if politicians were interested in leading difficult conversations instead of pandering to the basis, prejudices, and knee-jerk reactions of the population. Instead, we'll continue to get the same old sloganeering and rabble-rousing rhetoric, and in the end, we'll be left worse off for it. So, there you go. And uh, Cassie Lake does say here appropriately, fear is a distraction. 
But the other thing with fear is that over time, it um, has decreasing benefits. Because as you get be told, fear this, fear this, fear this, and you don't see the fear, it doesn't materialize. In order to make you afraid the next time, they got to up the ante. They got to make it scarier. You get inured to the fear, especially when the bad thing, the worst thing doesn't happen. So, um, if Pierre Polyev is already at this stage, at volume 12, where can he go during an election? How much higher can he go? How much more strident can he get without starting to look like a fool? I, yeah. It, it's, it's not a winning game. It's not a winning game. All right. Kids and Cubs. That's the end of this even longer than the original show episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. We love it when you do. If you would like to support us, you can by going to our pod page, podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of them. And I still don't know where Mr. Grizzly put the QR code um, in all of this uh, for pod page. He seems to be able to bring it up really easy, but I just cannot seem to find it in any way, shape, or form here. Um, so uh, I'm sorry I can't uh, get that to you. Uh, but if you go there, uh, we do really, really appreciate it. Um, if you would like to uh, help us in other ways, make like Kit Elaine and surf on down to our YouTube page, and if you scan that QR code that's right there, uh, you can uh, go there now and uh, click our buttons, like, share, and subscribe. And uh, that helps us out a lot. If you want to help us out in another way, our coffee page, which is now the QR code that is there if you're on the screen. If you scan that, that will bring you to our tip jar where you can leave us a little something uh, if you would like to encourage us uh, to keep on making this product for you. Uh, we appreciate all the support that you have uh, given us uh, to date. And uh, since on the last show, I promised that I would give a shout out. And uh, essentially, I have time now. Uh, let's do it. <laughs> um, thank you to Kit Ina, uh, who uh, basically uh, sent us, uh, well, just sent us a little something. I'm not sure whether or not they sent us um, uh, a comment to go along with it this time around. Uh, but uh, yes. Kit Ina uh, gave us a little bit of support, and uh, we thank you very much uh, for it. And uh, Kit Wendy said, uh, Thank fella, thanks, fellas. Uh, sent us some hearts, uh, a beer emoji, awesome as always, and a thumbs up. And uh, thank you to uh, Kit Paul, uh, who also sent us a little something. Uh, I believe uh, he was a first time contributor to our show. And uh, we really do appreciate that. Also, uh, thank you to Kit Vim uh, for having uh, given us a little something through the Super Chat the other day. We, uh, every drop and tittle adds to the pot, so we definitely appreciate your support. Um, because democracy is something that you do, uh, because you've got some by-elections coming up and some provincial elections, please check out uh, your candidates. See if you can volunteer for one of them or volunteer uh, uh, at a polling station because uh, we need good people to do that type of stuff. Ah, words of wisdom, because I can't rely on Mr. Grizzly today. Uh, I am going to say that Kids and Cups, number one, hydrate, because uh, if you happen to be in an area with uh, the extreme heat warning, you do need to do that. If you're going to do any exercise, please keep it in moderation. Please, please, please make sure you super hydrate if you do that. But it might be a day to take a pass on that, to be totally honest, if you can. All right. From the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying, it could be a tough world out there. So please be kind to and gentle with yourself. And now I am going to see if I am able to uh, stick the landing on the outro. So uh, please, kits and cubs, uh, be uh, just a little patient with me. 
while I try to see if I make this happen the right way. <laughs> you are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Miss v. Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients Fill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. And of course, I did not stick the landing. <laughs> I played the wrong bumper first. Oh, well. All right, kids. Uh, have a most beaverific weekend, and uh, we'll see you on Monday. Okay? Bye. Ah, uh, this is not working for me.